Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Music Rating, Ranking, and Reviewing Podcast that we like to call Music Meltdown, in which we rate, rank, and review any artist's discography, songs, musical topics, really whatever comes to mind. This episode, I have Alex back, and for an artist at which he is incredibly passionate for. <laughs> Although, maybe less, maybe not what you would anticipate from his prior appearances of Elton John and uh, Bonnie Iver. It's actually going to be the artist pop queen of the 2010s and currently the 2020s, Taylor Swift, which definitely the furthest dive or the furthest dive into sure hip hop I have done. Could make a case of Lord possibly more so, but I feel like look at the state of their careers, who is currently ruling the entirety of popular music and who just had her most reviled record come out two years ago. Arguably both. But um, anyways, uh, Taylor Swift is an artist that I had dabbled with a bit in the past. I had known before this read 1989 and folklore pretty well. And I tried to listen to Midnight's last year and fell asleep. So that was fun. Uh, that being said, however, I knew a lot of her hits. I actually knew a lot more of her hits than I thought because some country stations near me actually play a ton of stuff on the self-titled record. I knew like every song off that one. And I recognized a couple of stuff from Fearless and like Speak Now. I, I pretty much knew all of her bigger hits, as you can tell just by looking at this face right here. Younger, younger personality. So I've lived in the era of Taylor. That being said, though, I think that this is going to be an interesting catalog for me to do because it's definitely not traditionally in my wheelhouse, but I'll get I'll let the cat out of the bag. It was very refreshing do some pop music after all of this rock and sort of more experimental stuff that I've been listening to as of late. Just felt nice to, for lack of a better term, dumb it down, if you will. Although I know that you're definitely going to screw with that assessment. Talk about how Taylor Swift changed your life now. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't disagree with the dumb it down thing just because it's Taylor Swift, because I think, I think pop music takes a lot of talent to write, especially if you're involved in the production aspect of it too. But uh, in any case, Taylor Swift was not someone who I liked for a very long time. Um, so I'm, I mean, I'm a younger, younger person as well. So I remember, I don't really remember like the hype around the self-titled when it came out, but I definitely remember like Fearless Onward, like all the radio hits and stuff kind of as they were coming out. And for a while, I just didn't really care. Um, I think I used to find her voice annoying. I don't know. There was a lot of a lot of aspects about her music and her personality that just annoyed me. I think it was also that kind of association with the tabloids that kind of turned me off. Um, and then I remember when Reputation came out, I joined the bandwagon of people who were kind of shitting on that album and look what you made me do, especially like that was a wild time um and i don't really remember when lover came out like because i think that record was kind of buried by other stuff that i'll probably talk about when we get there but then in like the early part of 2020 so like i don't know this is probably like a month or so after covid kind of you know locked everybody down if you will um my roommate got me to watch that netflix documentary uh miss americana and which kind of talks about the making of the lover album and kind of gets into like her own personal life. And I thought she came off really well in it. Um, just came off really like as a really intelligent person, a really hardworking person. Um, the songs that they were playing in there really like started appealing to me at that point. I think I'd become more open-minded to pop music around that point so that I binged all her albums and fell in love with um, those, those songs at the time. And then a few months later, a little album called Folklore dropped and I became obsessed with that. And yeah, I haven't really looked back since, but I, at the same time, I wouldn't say that Taylor was one of my absolute favorite artists until maybe within the last year. Um, I think the, I've had some friends of mine who have kind of um, re-engaged re my interest in her music recently. And now she's kind of, I mean, as we're, as we're going to find out, I consider her one of my favorites. And I think in all, 
an all timer in the world of like pop music and pop songwriting. And I think this whole video is going to be me trying to make a case for that because I think a lot of die hard, like hardcore music fans kind of turn their noses up at pop music and the idea that a modern pop songwriter could be considered among kind of the greatest songwriters of all time or even the greatest pop songwriters of all time. So I really want to, I don't know, kind of challenge that idea a little bit. So, you know, I come in here with a mission is what I'm trying to say. Nice. I, I, I will say this. I am very open-minded to what you're going to say. I would say whenever I was first getting into music, in many ways, I was also very much in that poo-poo on pop mentality. If you've paid attention to any of my lists recently and what I care for, a good melody combined with a little bit of intricate lyrics. Essentially, I just want everything to be Amy Mann. So uh, if you can make a case to where Taylor's supposed to be Amy Mann, I'll take it over the goddamn Phoebe Bridgers comparison. So, <laughs> Oh, man. I respect Amy Mann, but don't, don't, don't do Phoebe like that. Uh, I'm a big Phoebe fan. That, that'd be a fun one. I saw you picked up uh, Strangers on the Alps a little bit ago. Yeah, I, I already I already had Punisher, which I do uh -huh. like more, but Stranger in the Alps is still like probably a 4.5 for me. He's an artist that uh, one of those ones that the hype kind of killed any chance of me really loving her, if that makes sense. It does, Just, yeah. There's a lot of, not to go on a Phoebe Bridgers tangent, but I'm yeah, sure. I think there's a lot of hype around her being kind of indie folk and indie rocks, like kind of main female songwriter right now like she's kind of it and i think that's um i say look at the other two members in boy genius i mean yeah i i don't know i still might say phoebe's my favorite out of them as far as songwriters go but there's a lot of talent um there's a lot of talent out there and i mean phoebe Absolutely. would be the first to admit it admittedly i'm biased because phoebe is a huge elliot smith fan and so am i so yeah. you know Maybe eventually my Elliot Smith video that I recorded in December will come out. Yeah. And you'll figure out my opinions. One other thing I did want to point out, kind of like I did with the Bon Iver video where I did the clever little pivot to show the album right behind me. Um, but up here on the wall, that is the, I think, November 2020 Rolling Stone magazine cover. Um, it was one of those like artists interview artists types of things that this was the one where Paul McCartney and Taylor Swift interviewed each other. Um, there, I mean, McCartney... Yeah, I, I could do a whole video talking about how much I love his stuff. And I've done a video about how much I hate most of it. <laughs> well, you know, for another day, perhaps. But yeah. but he, seeing them kind of like talk with each other and seeing that strong mutual respect between them. I don't know how many people have heard the story that like at the time they did this, McCartney had just announced McCartney 3. Um, and Taylor was finishing up Evermore, but that was kind of on the down low. And she told Paul during the interview, kind of, hey, I'm recording this like secret album. And it turned out they were going to be releasing it on the same day. So she actually pushed her album release back by a week to help his like sales figures, essentially. Um, which is, I mean, when you phrase it that way, it seems like egotistical, like, well, I know I'm going to outsell you. So uh, I'm going to cut you a break, you know, but I do think well, it was a cool, cool gesture. I mean, I could try and be subtle about it, but I mean, I think most things, if we're going strictly based off quality, should outsell McCartney 3. So, <laughs> that means it's, it's not one of my favorites, but I do still, I like it. I believe it was second from the bottom for me, from what we counted. So, wow. Wow. I'll, I'll tell you my McCartney list when we're done with this, because I think it's yeah. an interesting one. Yeah. That being said, however, I have you kick this off because you've more so alluded to your. Fandom being slightly higher than mine. Or right, we'll see. Perhaps yeah. I'm a secret uh, Taylor stand. Yeah, we'll see. Um, my number 10, and I, th I think this is the obvious number 10. I, I don't think it could be anything else. Um, I have the 2006 self-titled. Um, I have this at a kind of pretty low three and a half stars. Um, I know we were talking before this. Um, this is the only album that I have below four stars, um, but yeah, it's pretty significantly below everything else. Um, this is kind of her most like traditionally Nashville sounding album. There's a 
like it's very married to that kind of production style with all these like professional studio musicians backing her that I mean it all sounds great but it's kind of a bit anonymous at the same time and then you have like the male backing vocalists which are mixed really up front sometimes which can be effective maybe sometimes but it's a bit weird in this context because I mean she's she's only 17 guys like it's it's kind of a weird contrast 17 year old and then this guy who's probably in his like 40s like singing almost as a duet with her um Weakest part of the album is definitely the vocals. Not really a big fan when she tries to belt in this time period. A uh, place in this world is one where I think she kind of suffers. I think it took a while for her to really figure out that area of her range. And then there's also just that that country twang. She does this on some of her early albums where she adds this like, you know, this y'all kind of drawl sound. And it seems seems artificial. I mean, you know, hindsight's 2020. We know that she's from Pennsylvania. She's not from Nashville originally, but still, I don't know, not a huge fan of it. But um, beyond that, I think there's still some great songwriting here. Tim McGraw, I think, is a really like complete sounding opening song, which is, you know, and just an opening statement to her career. Um, I think it's really great. If it's not my favorite, it's second only to Teardrops on My Guitar. I think it appears a nice lyrical touch there with the best melody on the album by far. And I think the most impressive thing about it, and I think everyone speaks to it, is that she wrote all of these songs herself. I think even the ones where there are co-writers seem like the co-writers were there to flesh out ideas, but it all seems like, like it's her style. It's her kind of sentiments you already hear these songwriting characteristics that continue through to this day sometimes it's not always perfect you have kind of these lyrical missteps like stay beautiful which is this kind of late 2000s like jason baraz pseudo positive energy type of track where she like rhymes day with day at one point which is eh, i don't know um and there's not really any bridges on these songs like I think the bridges are like one line a piece and that's about it. Um, but again, it's a good starting point. I think the best of the songs that she writes completely on her own there is Should Have Said No, which apparently she wrote in 20 minutes and recorded right before the album was released. Very, very like aggressive song. Um, so I think that's cool. <laughs> but yeah, it's a good start. Um, but I don't think it's one of the all-time great debut albums per se. And I think it's a major step below everything else in their catalog um but as far as albums made by 16 17 year olds go i mean it's probably near the top of those for sure so uh again low low three and a half okay yeah i think that you know it's coming so let's just get it out of the way not my bottom my bottom is midnights and i don't even think it's close this is far and away my least favorite album that she did. And I can attribute 95% of this to Jack Antonoff. Well, I did like him across the 2020 projects. I do not like his production touches at all across this record. To, to be blunt, I think it sounds dated within 2022. It sounds more so like that late 2010s, early 2014, 2018 production style, which I just don't get it, especially how big this record is. Because I also think that this is bar none her worst set of material. Um, I mentioned it to you before, but the track Antihero, um, I do not understand the appeal. I think that the pre-chorus is quite frankly one of the worst things that she has ever written. Hey, hi, I'm the problem, it's me. Uh, Fuck off, no. You're trying to be self-aware, but you aren't being clever, you aren't being quirky. You just kind of sound like that one kid sitting in the back of the room who acts like he knows he's better than everybody else and is trying to like be self-aware about his flaws. Like, no, get out of here. Thank you. But anyways, I I actually think underneath that is a pretty well-constructed pop song. It's just, I think of that track is littered with some of her worst lyrical moments in general. Because this is something that I'm going to say. I feel like this record, and most notably that song, plays similar to how the reception and sort of perception that Reputation got, as Reputation being kind of her assuming the villain in a way, her sort of acknowledging her flaws and sort of approaching them. 
I feel like that record really isn't that. It's very much 1989 part two, but a little bit darker, I feel like. And on Antihero especially, it's her more so approaching that. And I feel like it could possibly be a trip, be sort of called back to a track like Look What You Made Me Do. The issue, however, that song was actually very different from most other Taylor works. While this one could just be lumped in with most of the stuff she was doing on something like Lover in 1989, I think it's very anonymous, which is how I would describe a lot of this record. It's muddled by the Jack Antonoff production. I don't think Taylor Swift brought much of her best material at all. And to be blunt, like I said before, I fell asleep to this album and I wish I did again. It's very much bordering between two and one and a half, probably closer to the former. However, I just think this is a really lousy record. I, I do get higher than this, but I simply do not understand the appeal of Midnight's. Uh, sorry, Clay. Love you. Number 10, Midnight's. I can't remember if you mentioned, but did you have like a song that you liked on there? Uh, Mastermind was okay. That was interesting. And I like the backing number to Antihero. I just think we're including that tracks on this. Okay. Interesting. Um, I, I, was, I, I feel like you're going to be trying to decipher my taste this whole time while I'm trying to pick up on why you're so in love with her. And it's going to be an interesting back and forth <laughs> as we're slowly starting to understand each other more. It's just going to be a lot of like, it's going to be a lot of silence and just us like doing like this, like or, oh, like, yeah. with our eyes closed trying to ponder. What could it be? What could it be? What makes Absolutely. them tick? Absolutely. Um, all right. Well, my number nine um, is not Midnight's. My number nine is uh, 2008's Fearless. Um, four stars for that one. I think the storytelling takes a really noticeable leap forward on this one compared to the debut. Um, and really, I think the songwriting and arranging in general is much more mature. And I don't mean that in terms of the topics that she's writing about, um, because I think, because again, it's a lot of like kind of high school romance type of ideas. And I think she was already looking at those pretty maturely in the debut album. But I think the presentation is more fleshed out here. Um, Love Story, it's the most famous song on the album. And I think it might even be the best example of her songwriting growth. Um, one thing that she does a lot um, in her songwriting is changing the lyrics of the chorus kind of during each iteration of the chorus to kind of progress whatever narrative or story that she's telling. And I think this is like the actual, like the first example of that. She kind of like does these little tricks. She doubles the length of the second chorus, adding that extra like stanza or whatever, and then completely changing the third chorus lyrics while doing a key change at the same time. It's really kind of, <clears throat> it's these little like songwriting tricks that you would expect from a very experienced like professional pop songwriter. And she's just kind of throwing these things out there at, you know, again, age 18, basically. So it's already kind of proof that she's absorbing a lot of what she's hearing and that she's able to kind of, I don't know, express that and to kind of add a, her own kind of creative spin on it. Um, and I think that speaks to the appeal of her as a songwriter in general, kind of conveying these stories that appeal to the target audience of pop music, um, teenage girls with pretty elegant songwriting ideas um, that again, like some professional songwriters two or three times her age don't even use. Um, you then have kind of that lyrical sentiment flipped on the song White Horse, which is maybe my favorite song on the album just because of how sobering it is. That teenage angst is kind of destroyed there in favor of Taylor kind of facing reality that everything isn't fairy tales. This is small town life and bullshit happens, believe it or not. Um, I'm not going to get too deep into like the kind of the Swifty fandom theories because I, I don't follow I don't follow them super deeply myself, but this one kind of begins this idea of how the track sequencing theory that like um, she kind of reserves the fit, the number five slot, track five for like her most emotionally kind of penetrating song, the one that's like most personal for her. 
Um, and it pretty well, it actually pretty well lines up when you actually look at the albums. Um, I think it is actually something she consciously does. So not just a conspiracy theory. Um, from a production standpoint, albums much less in your face than the debut is. I really enjoyed the organ sounds in Hey Steven, the string arrangement um, by Jonathan Yudkin in Breathe, the piano and The Way I Loved You. Still get some of that fake Nashville drawl and stuff like You Belong With Me, though it's still less noticeable than before. Um, what keeps this album from raising higher or from being like a 4.5 or something is just that it kind of loses steam towards the end. You're going to... I think this is one of the big critiques I have with her sequencing. A lot of her albums suffer from being a bit overly long and the momentum kind of falling off near the end. In this case around, you're not sorry, but there's still good moments afterwards. The baseline in Forever and Always is really, really good. Um, I do want to acknowledge um, the Taylor's version um, re-release briefly. Um, for context, we're recording this, because I don't know when this is coming out, but we're recording this in May of 2023. Um, so this is before the Speak Now Taylor's version comes out. So I have no context for what that is like. Um, so only mentioning Fearless and Red as far as the re-recordings go. Um, the Fearless Taylor's version is kind of strange to hear Jack Antonoff's production style merge with these songs because he plays a pretty big part in that, but it works well enough. I really like Don't You um, and the Marin Morris duet, You All Over Me. Um, and I, the Keith Urban duet is kind of good too. I mean, that's that's one where it's like, okay, that's an effective 2008 throwback because that is that is Keith Urban's time um, and very effective at kind of creating that atmosphere. Um, but as we'll see later, I think that is so far the vastly inferior collection of outtakes compared to uh, Red, Taylor's version. So yeah, four stars for Fearless. To uh, Adam and I, I I just wanted to ask because I knew you would have the context to it. Are the bonus tracks, were they songs that she was already working on in that previous time? Or are these her sort of taking that idea of going back to that time and sort of remit and creating songs that she would have in that time period, but like making it now under that gaze? That's yeah. something I was thinking about at work the other day. No, that's a good question. Um, these are, to my understanding, all songs that she wrote during that time. So these are all fearless outtakes that either there are recordings of, but they were only released as bonus tracks or they were just never released to the public and she just re-recorded them. The production interpretation, sometimes she takes kind of creative liberty with that. I know definitely in red, there's a lot of that happening um, with like the outtakes there. But um, yeah, these are like actual like um, songs that she wrote in the time period, which I think is cool. I will say I love Mr. Perfectly Fine. I, I'd heard the bonus tracks on there. That that's definitely my favorite of those. Yes. Not quite talking about Fearless yet. And my number nine, don't fret, it's a self-titled record. Um, but this is a lot better than I was expecting it to be. Um, it's pretty by the books, pop country, but um I still think even at this point, Taylor is a very good voice. And I think the production across this record is far better than what I was expecting. The guitars sound lovely and the overall musicianship is very solid. Perhaps this is also coming off of me doing the White Stripes in which Loudness Wars really ruins Jack White's guitar tones across a lot of those records for me. Uh, not sorry, Jack, but White Stripes. Uh, that's going to be my new catchphrase. Sorry, Eric. Uh, but uh, no, I think uh, I think it suits the songs fairly well and the songs are generally speaking decent across here. Nothing outright awful, but there are some pretty high highs. As you mentioned before, Tim McGraw, it's a really good song. Uh, Cold as You is my favorite across here as well. Tied Together with Smile is pretty good. I've never really been crazy about teardrops on my guitar. And um, maybe that's just me. I think it's a good song. And I understand the, the uh, importance of it within her catalog, of course. It's just not necessarily a song that speaks too strongly to me. And um, what, what was the song that you said that she wrote in like 20 minutes across here? I don't have it written in my notes for them. At least, oh, I definitely should it, have. It is a, a should have said no. Okay, yeah, I've never liked that one. That one, for whatever reason, I thought that a lot of the hits on here, for whatever reason, I got Carrie Underwood feelings from them. I just thought internally they were like Carrie Underwood songs or something. Mm -hmm. And as such, I don't like them very much. That being the biggest example of which I feel like it does show that it was written in such a short period of time. And I do agree that the country rockers on here are not I don't think that she has nearly developed her vocal range enough to be able to belt out like that. And to be perfectly honest, I don't think that she ever quite does. 
I generally prefer her whenever she's being a bit more introspective, perhaps a bit more uh, somber in her tone, but we'll get to that later. Um, overall, I think this is a three-star album. I think it's pretty solid. There's a couple of highlights across here, but overall, it's just decent. Uh, three stars for Taylor Swift's self-titled band. My number nine. Yeah, I I struggle a bit with Taylor as a singer. I don't I don't think she is a great singer. Um, I think she is good. I think she gets more out of her instrument, if you will, than I think most people would um, kind of having that natural voice. But yeah, I think she kind of, especially like her like mid-range and her lower range in recent albums, I think that's where her strength is. I think when she's belting, sometimes it works really well. Um, sometimes it doesn't. So it's a little bit more hit or miss for me. I will say that's interesting because her voice is almost consistently the positive across all of these records, even kind of midnights, I guess. But um, yeah, that's the thing that I kind of realized I was taking for granted before. I actually think that she's a very strong singer, really able to utilize her range in a way that you really wouldn't expect out of the sort of basic pop singer once again basic you know pop music's great but relative mm -hmm. relative yeah. yeah i think it's like i think she she doesn't have the kind of like when i when i think like fantastic pop singers i think something like i mean cliche like ariana grande or like um you know so, beyonce or something just kind of technical technical like marvels as far as like what they can do and she's yeah. definitely not on that level um but yeah, I think it's how she uses her voice that I think is really, really effective. And I think she's really good at layering her vocals, um, which is actually part of what I'm going to talk about with my number eight. So good segue. Um, my number eight, we're going to keep going chronological. I have 2010 speak now. Four point, four point five stars. That's hot. That, that's hot right there. So You're yeah. Smoky. A little bit, con little bit controversial, um, and that means obviously that eight of her ten albums are four and a half stars or higher for me. Um, it's, yeah, this album grew on me more than any other during this re-listen. Um, I think before I kind of saw it as a bit interchangeable with Fearless, and I might have even put it below Fearless, um, just because it doesn't have as many like of like the really great catchy hits or whatever. But really listening to it again, I think this is yet another step forward for Taylor's songwriting, um, partially because this is her first album and as of now the only album where she's the only credited songwriter on it, um, which people made a big deal out of at the time. And I think honestly, that was intended to make a statement um, against kind of critics who were skeptical that she actually like wrote all of her songs. I think in truth, these songs aren't that much more self-written than her usual tracks, um, just because, again, I really think she's like the driving force behind all the songs, even the ones where there are co-writers credit uh, credited. Um, so yeah, she's very self-sufficient. I think it really is more just to prove a point than anything else. Um, I think it's also a step forward in part because it's a bit grittier, relatively speaking. Again, gritty for Taylor Swift. And the lyrics are exploring more of those kind of darker, unhappier sentiments that she was touching on in like White Horse. It feels more grounded and a little bit more kind of explicit. And I hear, feel her like digging into her emotions more. And I love that. Um, <clears throat> there are other songs of hers that name drop the people she's writing them about. She does that a few times in kind of those first couple of albums. I think in part for a sense of like shock value. Um, but on this album, for the most part, she doesn't even have to do that. I mean, I think about the song Mean, you know, probably the most famous song on the album. And that's because it tears apart whoever the subject of that song is thoroughly, so thoroughly, with this kind of like schoolyard, like, yeah, yeah, like cadence in the chorus, which would be annoying, um, which would be really annoying if the hook wasn't so damn good. I think the hook on that song is killer um, and the vocals. I think she really takes a step forward vocally on this album. 
the harmonies on that that hook i think are really really good it just feels like she's coming into her own her own voice both kind of literally and from a songwriting perspective um i think the so-called like unsung hero of these early swift albums is nathan chapman the producer he produced her first three records produced most of red and also has one song on 1989 um and I think this album represents the peak of his collaboration with Taylor, where she contributes the songs and he really arranges them super effectively. I will say it makes sense how she would look for kind of other collaborators after this album, because I think his style of country production, which is very like 2000s, like loudness wars, like, you know, very, very loud production was on the cusp of going out of style. And as we'll see in red, her songwriting was clearly going in different directions that I don't think he was especially suited for. But anyways, there are some incredible songs on here. Back to December and Dear John are these songs that kind of describe failed relationships on different ends of the spectrum. Back to December is an apology. Apparently that's about Taylor Lautner. Um, but Dear John, oh boy, this song is brutal. Uh, subject to that song is John Mayer. And I think... In some, way, in some ways, I honestly don't think John Mayer's public image has entirely recovered from what Swift says about him here. Um, he, he doesn't look good, we'll put it that way. Um, looks, a, looks like a fucking creep. Um, love the beat on that. It's that kind of swung shuffle beat that you could like come straight out of something like Lover You Should Have Come Over by Jeff Buckley or something, complete with those like dynamic shifts that are really strong. And I think her vocal on there is really, really terrific um enchanted is another highlight i think that's one of her very best melodies um really love that one um and yeah this album grew like i said it grew on me a lot this listen through why isn't it higher because there are seven albums i like more and also because admittedly the production it wears thin after 67 full minutes kind of like fearless and how it falls off towards the end although I do like the penultimate track, Last Kiss, very kind of melancholy song that I did quite a bit. But yeah, number eight, uh, eight four and a half star albums or higher for Taylor Swift for me. I gotta say, pointing out the production on that one, but you haven't talked about Midnight Skid is perplexing to me. But we will get there. And we will get we will. there. Hopefully soon. But anyways. Uh, I got. I gotta say, speak speaking out of that. Whoa, ooh, ooh, burning. Place pissed. But anyways, yeah, I've got one. I've got one take that I think is spicier, but we'll get to it. I have that same take. I expect. All right, we'll get there. We'll see. All right, number, number eight for me. Uh, Going to be fearless. Um, I view this album in essentially the exact same light as a self titled. Except I think that the rockers honestly aren't as good on here, but I like the slower stuff a bit more. I think Taylor's voice is still very strong. Um, on the weaker end of the cuts here, I do quite enjoy the string work, which is what elevates this and makes me wish that she utilized strings a bit more throughout her catalog because I think that they complement her very well. However, she obviously went into a direction in which they wouldn't be as necessary. If I'm hearing a Baroque pop Taylor Swift, I mean, that'd be interesting. Some, yeah. Get some 60s Bee Gees in that shit. Ooh. Anyways. <laughs> Yeah. Um, my favorites on here were Love Story, Hey Steven, and White Horse, but I can't help but have an absolutely immensely high level of nostalgia for You Belong in Me. I remember as a little, little kid, as a little girl in the living room, just watching the music video and just running around dancing to that shit. It's <laughs> fucking stupid. I hate old me. But anyways, I, I was happy. But uh, yeah, I, uh, it's a decent record. I have this one at three stars as well. I pretty much view it in the exact same light as Cell Tail, just think it's a little bit better song-wise. And I do think it has aged ever so slightly better. So number eight, Fearless, three stars. Nice. All right. Um, okay, we're going to get to my spicy take now. Number seven, um, I am sticking chronological. Now I'm going to go with 2012's Red. Four I take back what I said. Four and a half stars. Um, this is a lot of people's number one um, or number two, top two, top three. And I understand it from a historical standpoint. It is, I think career-wise, this is her most significant album or 
that worst or second most significant album um, just because of what it represents, her shift towards actual, like, just straight up pop music. Um, yeah, it's sonically more adventurous than anything before it by a country mile, like not even close. And um, like you have Treacherous, like Treacherous has this really kind of different, like really static melody like that doesn't really go anywhere. It's like a little bit one note that I think is really, really cool. Um, you also have that kind of alternative feel on the song The Last Time featuring Gary Lightbody of Snow Patrol. Um, this, uh, this one though, I think is actually one of the tracks that suffers from being too loud still. Uh, that guitar solo in the middle feels a little bit kind of, I don't know if it's over compressed or overdriven or what it is, but it's a little bit, a little bit grating. Um, on that front um and i don't i don't like the ed sheeran song all that much everything has changed uh not not a big fan of that one and then i have conflicted feelings on the max martin and shellback songs um i love the hook of i knew you were trouble um i i think all three of the songs themselves are really good but with I Knew You Were Trouble specifically, those dubstep inspired breakdowns in the choruses have aged terribly. Um, they're, and they're pretty tame too. Like if you're gonna go ham, do that kind of like overdriven like Skrillex shit where like the bass is just like farting out of your headphones and stuff like that. Like go, go ham. This is just really kind of weak. Um, I, love the, I love the actual song though. It's a good, it's a bop. It's a bop for sure. Um, and I do love the backwards guitar loops and we are never, ever getting back together. I think that's a really, really cool little, little trick, little Beatles inspired trick perhaps. Um, but overall, uh, songwriting wise, I think it's pretty much on par with Speak Now, more developed in some areas, also trying to reach out into the pop sphere again. I think that's cool because it takes a different skill set to write some of these pop hooks, um, these pop songs compared to country songs, the kind of the lyrical cadences are different um 22 is probably my pick for the most obviously pop songwriting approach because those choruses are very lyrically concise a bit repetitive perhaps and i think even at this point she's already really damn good at it um i think it's a great song um obviously fucking obviously the standout track here is all too well um to this day, it might be her best vocal performance, um, just with how dynamic it is. And there's something about the emotions that she talks about here. Um, it's very raw emotional anguish, I think. Um, again, a breakup song that, like Dear John did to John Mayer, I don't think Jake Gyllenhaal's popular reputation is ever going to fully recover from this. Um, especially that bridge section. Um, the kind of alliteration in the line, you called me up again just to break me like a promise. So casually cruel in the name of being honest. I think that's a fucking phenomenal lyric, if I'm being honest. Um, I think this song, as well as some of the others we're going to be getting to, is such a strong example of how I believe we have to treat her as one of pop music's greatest lyricists. Not just of her generation, but maybe ever. It's accessible stuff. And that's the key, right, for pop music. It's not really surrealistic poetry. It's not really overly artsy in the way that most music critics get their kicks out of, right? But it's always clever enough that you're constantly left thinking, damn, you know, I wouldn't have thought of that, but it makes total sense. And it appeals to something that I've heard Rob Sheffield talk about before. I, I adore Rob Sheffield. Rob Sheffield is like the ultimate, like, pop music fan playing the role of music critic. I love just kind of the unbridled optimism that he has. I think it's very, very wholesome. And I think it comes from a genuine place. Um, and if you haven't read his books, phenomenal. Love is a mixtape um, is like, that kills you um, emotionally. But anyways, I, Sheffield's talked about kind of that idea that teenage girls, again, pop music is kind of target audience are actually the most difficult audience to please because they haven't established loyalties yet. They're not really at that developmental stage where they necessarily have per se. 
So as a result, they're not afraid to pass judgments quickly and sometimes harshly. So in order to kind of curry their favor consistently takes a very deft hand, especially when you're also trying to remain like artistically true to yourself as well. So I think the fact that certain artists, certain bands nailed it, I think Taylor Swift has nailed it consistently for, you know, 15 years plus at this point. Um, I think the Beatles nailed it. I think that's one of their calling cards. Not surprised that Rob Sheffield's maybe two favorite acts are the Beatles and Taylor Swift. Um, I think it's a hell of a thing to do. And I think it's really impressive when artists and bands do it. But anyways, really major landmark moment for sure. And I think the more diverse sonic palette helps the sequencing feel more fluid and the runtime feel less lengthy. Love ending with that really melancholy yet kind of hopeful song, Begin Again. Really love that song. And then just to briefly talk about Taylor's version, because I can honestly go on and on about these outtakes, um, really speaks to her creativity during this period. Message in a Bottle is this brand new Shellback production. Max Martin isn't involved with the new Taylor's version things at all. Um, I actually don't know why it might be a record label thing, but Message in a Bottle, entirely new production from Shellback specifically that I almost prefer to the actual work he did on the real album. Um, Chris Stapleton as a backing vocalist is kind of a weird fit, but he works really well on I Bet You Think About Me. Um, I think that's really cool. But the highlight, going back to Phoebe Bridgers, is nothing new. I think it's obvious why it was left off the album because it's very dark and somber in a way that the other al songs aren't quite as much, and they probably thought it was a bit too mature. But boy, it works here, especially with someone like Phoebe who could really pull out those kind of more somber emotions and talk about... Um, you know, those themes of being, you know, maybe a little bit more emotionally uh, volatile, I guess, especially in your younger days. Um, so yeah, 4.5 stars for Red. I mean, it's a fantastic album. It's just, again, six albums that I liked more than it. So that's where it slots in. That is fucking crazy. And I don't know how you, being as big of a Taylor fan as you are, have came to this conclusion. Once again, below midnight, what the fuck? But anyways, uh, let's talk about my number seven. Also, so, sorry if I'm coming across as rude. I just genuinely can't comprehend this, but. No, you know, I, <laughs> I don't think my opinion represents most people's. I'm a, I'm a lone wolf and I'm okay with that. Absolutely. And hey, you, you still love the record and that's all. That matters, so probably more than me. And it's going to be higher up on my list. So yeah. number seven for me. It's going to be Lover. Uh, this is one of the trickiest Taylor albums to assess. Uh, it's just so damn long and very much so bloated. As you mentioned before, I think pretty much all of her records, even the best ones, could do with like 10 minutes of trimming and Midnight's could do with 40 minutes of trimming. Um, I, I just, she is a good writer. I think that she is a very strong pop writer. She can write these immaculate hits. I think the deep cuts end up being somewhat hit or miss across the majority of her records. And you can absolutely trim her records down to 40 to 50 minutes. They don't need to be an hour long. And this is the worst example of that. There are 18 songs here. To be really honest, I only like 10 of them. Um, with that being said, the hits, Me and You Need to Come Down, are some of her worst. Um, I, I think that they're both pretty weakly written pop songs to be as honest as I can be. I probably slightly prefer me just because I absolutely love Brendan Yeri as a singer. As a panic fan, but yeah, we'll, we'll get there one of these days. But there are deeper cuts such as Miss Americana and The Heartbreak Prince, London Boy, and many others that didn't do a ton for me. Uh, despite that, there are plenty of great songs here. Uh, cool Summer, Lover, Papa's Rings, and my absolute favorite being False Sky which, dare I speak this to bring out a woman I love so much, but it almost reminded me a bit of Sade, which, if you've seen that episode, you know I very, very much favor Sade. The primary issue with this album is that, well, many people could see this as possibly a bit of a step into the right direction after the very polarizing reputation. I feel like in a very similar light, you could view this record as a bit of a retreat. While she experimented a bit and was a bit more experimental, 
on reputation across here, she's going back to a far more bare bones, a far more palatable pop music style, very much evidenced in the single me. And while I do like the album, I do give this one three and a half stars, a low three and a half stars, mind you. I feel like it's hard to deny that she was very much trying to win back an audience and in very many ways was trying to recapture perhaps the former glory of a record like 1989 or Red after experiencing probably the most outward backlash to the music with the record reputation. So it's at number seven. I have it at a low three and a half stars, so I do consider it good, but I, I have some fundamental issues with Lover, and why it's so fun for me. Right. I think I think your critiques are fair, even though I obviously have the album higher than you do. Um, and I do love the shout out to False God. I do agree that it has a little bit of a Sade vibe. Um, I'm also very partial to Sade, so good call out. My number six is going to be 2017's Reputation, four and a half stars. Um, this is Taylor's lowest rated album on Rate Your Music. It is a solid 2.43 out of five stars, um, coming in uh, just a little bit below the self-titled and Midnight's. It's been given a bad rap ever since the first singles came out. I kind of talked about that already. And again, I'm going to say right away, look what you made me do. I did not like it at the time. And I think the backlash to that song, which I was a part of, basically killed any chance this album had of being a critical success, even if it was always going to be a commercial success. I don't think it could recover from that. And while I still don't enjoy the, that kind of right said Fred interpolation in the, the chorus, you know, the I, I don't. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's still probably my least favorite song on the album. But I think blaming it for this album's failure is also a little bit harsh because um, it does have two other things working against it. It's the closest thing to a proper R&B album that Swift has ever made. And I say closest thing, closest thing to a proper R&B album. And that's not her wheelhouse at all. Um, and additionally, in the lyrics, it sort of addresses the tabloid drama of the previous few years in a way that reminds me of the Michael Jackson album, History. Um, where it confronts things so head on and in such an almost paranoid way that it turns people off more so than like bringing them to your side. Um, and I used to have this at the very bottom of my Taylor list, probably ranked at about two, two and a half stars. But I think recently this album has been given a reappraisal by music listeners because of the comparison you made with it being very similar tonally to Midnight's. And honestly, I think reevaluating it through that lens, it's grown on me a ton. Again, I don't think Taylor is a soulful singer at all, really. And when she tries to lean into those R&B sounds, like on the song Endgame, I just don't think it works well. Um, I think it's not a bad song necessarily, but I, I don't think she fits at all. I think Ed Sheeran fits better than she does on that one. And that's saying a lot because I'm not a fan of rapper Ed. Um, we'll have to do a video of him one of these days. Maybe that'll be your next pop bid. Um, I think where this album excels is when Max Martin and Shellback are kind of at the raids and they turn up the sounds to 11 and they throw this like lumbering wash of these aggressive synths and these stack choruses in your face and say, here, fucking deal with it, man. Um, Stuff like I did something bad and don't blame me, I think kind of um, just typify this. The choruses are infectious. My drug is my baby. I think that is a great line um, from Don't Blame Me. But not everything's super loud because then you have stuff like Delicate, which has this great subdued beat with a vocoder hook that shows some of her most vulnerable lyrics on the whole record. And the song Gorgeous kind of kickstarts this phase of Taylor's career where she's talking about her at the time, new relationship with Joe Alwyn. Um, and it kind of sounds like she's settled down into a stable relationship, which she would be in for the next six years. Um, very sad. Uh, and now she's with Maddie Healy from the 1975, who was a trash human being. I do like the 1975 as a band, but Maddie Healy is an awful person. 
Um, that's my two cents. Uh, Jack Antonoff as well. He did make his debut kind of on 1989 on a couple of songs, but he is in quite a few places here, especially in the second half of the album. I think it's fitting that he's producing that kind of last stretch of tracks because it also signifies that transition into the next phase of her career. The song Getaway Car, I think, is a spiritual successor to Out of the Woods from 1989, except this one actually has a melody. Um, and yeah, I think it's one of the best songs on the album easily. And that closing duo of Call What You Want and New Year's Day points Swift in the direction that her future albums will take with that kind of subdued electro pop that Antonov does, does so well, as we'll get to, followed by this like kind of earnest piano ballad that just really calms things down at the very end, which I also really love. Um, yeah, I think this album is a lot closer in quality to 1989 than people want to admit. Again, as you kind of spoke to earlier, it's just quite a bit weirder. And I don't think the songs are as good, admittedly, um, but you'll see what I think of 1989 um, and you'll realize how high of a bar that is. That's all I'm going to say. Four and a half stars. I, I have to say, it is incredibly fascinating. Uh, you and I are both evidently on the more positive sphere of that record. You get two entirely different perceptions on it because I don't get pretty much any of this R&B, this soulfulness that you're saying. And I'll explain that more in my review, but I find that very interesting. As well, you could not be more wrong about Endgame. Ed Sheeran is bar none the worst thing about there. I actually love Taylor and Future's parts on there. I think that he absolutely kills it. Future and not Taylor. kills it as in doing well, as in kills it as in he makes me want to die listening to his parts. Well, Future is, Future is the best part, I think. Okay, the no, no, for sure, for sure. Damn, that may have actually been the first time I'd ever heard of Future verse, which is interesting. Just having that yeah. hasn't really been on my radar. So, yeah. Uh, segue number six for me is going to be Speak Now. Um, perhaps also contentious that I have this one not in the top half of her records, but uh, assuming. Uh, I think this is a pretty good album overall. Another three and a half stars, although a more firm one than on Lover. This is kind of like seven and a half range, if you would define that. This one still has a bit of her early pop country flavor, but for the most part, this is her leaning more into more over pop and pop rock across here. Um, this is really the first record in which I think Taylor as a vocalist is really soaring as she continues to consistently be my favorite part across the records. Um, my favorite part about a Taylor Swift record is Taylor Swift. Whoa, that's some insight right there. Um, despite that, I think lyrically up to this point, it's definitely her finest work. Uh, the primary issue, what? Well, delves into consistency. It's an hour-long record, and simply put, I could trim at least 13 minutes out of here. The highs of highs are some of her best songs, though. Mine, Speak Now, Dear John, and Sorry Less are great. I think it closes incredibly well with Long Live. Um, of the bigger hits, though, I've never really loved Back to December, and very much the contrary point to you, I find meaning to be very annoying and very great for me, but is what it is. Overall, though, there's more good than bad. And if I could just turn it down a little bit, I would say that I like it a good bit. Uh, three and a half stars. And so pretty good album. Speak down. There's six. I'm not at five stars yet, but my number five is not Midnight's. It is going to be no. 20, 2019's Lover at a pretty high four and a half. Um, this... <laughs> I'm just watching you just like this is curl, suffering curl into a ball right now as I continue to push midnights higher and higher up my rankings. Uh, love her. Anyways, her first record on Republic um, after being with Big Machine before that. And I think it's interesting that, like I was saying earlier, this album's release cycle almost feels a bit forgotten about in hindsight. Um, because of all the press that was going on around big machine records, the whole controversy with her masters and stuff like that happened around this time, which sort of suppressed the hype cycle. Then, of course, after that, she wasn't able to tour the record because of COVID. So this occupies kind of this weird place in her chronology and gets a little bit overlooked as a result. I mean, people don't even like love to hate it like they do reputation. It just kind of exists. Um. Jack Antonoff takes over the reins for most of the album. And this is as good a time as any for me to say, just straight up, 
I don't mind his production style and I actually like it more often than I don't. I think he sort of toes the line between having a distinctive approach, whether you want to call it an Antonoff approach, whether you want to call it a bleachers approach, um, and then being generic enough to where he basically gives whatever his collaborators ask of him. If he wants to be kind of create this very, you know, bleachers like sound, this very like exciting sound, he can do that. Or if he, they just need something a bit more of like anonymous, like, you know, synth pad type sound, he can do that too. But he engages with his collaborators, um, kind of the ultimate good soldier, if you will. And by all accounts, super, super easy to work with. Um, people enjoy working with him. Hence why he's so popular among pop stars right now. So I, I'm going to give him his due. He's not one of my favorites. I'm not going to say that, but I think, I, I, I think there is a lot of value in his place in pop music right now. So that's what I'll say. My biggest critique of Lover is how front loaded it is. Um, after you get that kind of like that sassy defiant opening track, I forgot that you existed, which I think is a lot of fun. We go into Cruel Summer, which is one of her best hooks ever. It's paired with the super jubilant bombastic chorus that honestly makes the hair stick out on the back of my neck. Um, it's a phenomenal song, um, phenomenal pop song. And it would be the best song on the album. It almost is the best song on the album. But then we have the title track. Lover itself has a special place in my heart. It's this total throwback to like 60s pop um, with these really like disarmingly sincere, straightforward lyrics that are never quite overdone. It's sappy. It is, but it's sappy in a way that I can totally handle. Um, I might even say that it's my favorite chorus of hers, just in general, especially when like the backing vocals come in to kind of fill things out. It just gives me chills. Um, I just love it so much. I don't, I don't know if it's my favorite of hers. It's probably top two or three though. I'm a, a total sucker for it. Um, so yeah, the problem now though, is that the album has sort of played its two trump cards really early on. And while I still really, really, really like the rest of it, it's still a high 4.5. So I really like this album. It never quite lives up to those two high points. Um, plenty of other stuff I like. Uh, Paper Rings, which is this almost pop punk track that has this like infectious groove to it. Death by a Thousand Cuts. I love kind of the guitar riff, but I really love the intro on that thing. Um, the chorus is one of the more interesting ones on the record. And then there's a bunch of meditative, kind of more meditative tracks that I really like. I like Afterglow. I like uh, I like London Boy, False God, as you mentioned. Really like Cornelia Street. Really love that one. Um, I think just in general, the kind of sunny optimism of this record makes me think I like it more than I really do. Like, like I want to give this five stars. I'm close. But then I revisit it. And there are enough songs that I'm a bit more neutral on. Um, and then there's the two lead singles. Um, God bless Brendan Urie, best male pop singer of the last 20 years. Fight me. Um, I know you won't. You agree. But... Uh, but me is not a good song. Um, it is probably my, it might be my least favorite Taylor Swift song. At least look what you made me do is like, kind of, as you said, a little bit more just unique and just kind of off the wall with its approach. Me is one of the only tracks of Taylor's where it doesn't feel like she wrote it for any reason other than to make a hit. It just doesn't feel like it speaks to anything. It doesn't feel significant. It just feels like a summer song. I think you need to calm down is quite a bit better just because of the chorus. I think the chorus is really, really good. I've never been super moved by her attempted activism in that song. I don't think it's especially profound. Um, it's a nice gesture, um, but um, but I don't know. Uh, but yeah, those two songs being near the end of the track list help contribute to the sequencing just not lining up for me. Um, that's why I'm putting it a little bit lower than I was honestly expecting to. It's really enjoyable, but at this point, I mean, it's a high 4.5. That's somewhat close to a five. So really just playing a game of nitpicking at this point. And yeah, I would say this is her worst sequence album, period. Hence why it isn't higher. 
honestly, yeah, cut out me, cut out You Need to Calm Down and like one or two other songs. And this thing is a five-star album and a potential contender for my number one. Um, that's how much I like most of these songs. But only number five, but still four and a half stars. Okay. So uh, just got to point out, I love the uh, revisionist history on the album version of me where she cuts out the uh, ever so outstanding lyric of hers. <clears throat> Spelling is fun. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But, that quite, quite frankly, the best <laughs> point of lyrics throughout the entire catalog, if I must say. But yeah, may maybe, maybe cutting out that lyric from the album version was the best artistic decision she's ever made. I don't know if that's I'd not, go that far. That's because not I, true. That's not here, true. Here's, here's what I would say. I think I would almost prefer it being in that. Is I think it is so perplexingly awful. Like yeah. it is so downright. It, I don't even know how to describe how just baffling of an artistic choice I feel like that is. It, but I think I think that is a good point though because I think if if she had kept it in there, then you could make the argument that this is kind of not her going kind of bonkers experimental like look what you made me do but she's kind of like it, it makes the song feel more sarcastic because it almost feels like okay you cannot you can't have written that lyric earnestly like there's no way you couldn't have done that and not known it sounds a little bit dumb i i feel like part of it if it is meant to be somewhat sarcastic somewhat ironic i feel it very funny that of all the potential male pop singers that she could have picked she does go with Brendan Urie, who is very well known for having a bit of an ego to him, to put it lightly. Yes. I find that to be very interesting. She chose that. Yes. But anyways, that's my number five. Your predicted winner form. This is a part I have ever won, which perhaps is a bit alarming because this album is practically by my babies, my children, my beloveds, the national. Um, but this is another one really tricky for me to assess. It was released in the same year as Folklore. It never got quite as much appraisal. And it is often kind of written off as like a Folklore B-size by some people. And I kind of get it. This one's a bit rootsier, a bit less polished. It doesn't have as much sheen when compared to Folklore. And the songs are still very good. Although I feel like this one is a bit inconsistent. I do think that there are a couple of clunkers on here. Gold Rush, Tolerated, and Closure being primary examples of that for me. There are still some really good songs on here, and this style of music very much suits Taylor's form of writing. And I feel like this is truly where she finds the best voice for her. It's a shame that she ruins it by going to Antonoff and utilizing all of his worst production qualities on Midnight's. Um, my favorites here were Happiness, Dorothea, and the title track Evermore. Uh, there are other highlights as well, though. I only have this one at three and a half. It's good. However, I think it lacks the highlights of her overall career for me. And I, I will say, I wish it sounded more like The Nash. Because there's like one song that has such like a straight ahead national drum beat. And I live for that. I love it. Give me those on every Taylor Swift record and I'll bump each of these records up a half star for that as well. I don't care how out of place those sound. I love them as a drummer. So. And I, I want to say this about Anton. I do not hate him. I actually really liked him on Solar Power, which is interesting because people think that he ruined Lord. And I do think that he has good production elements in other places. I very much enjoy the debut Bleachers record and the motion by Carly Rae Jepsen, who's evidently a modern pop classic. Uh, the issue, however, um, his sound has been very sterile for a while now. I feel like it became especially predominant with the two records he made with Lana in 2021, where I feel like he just loses so much character at that point. Even on the, I don't know if it's the second or the third Bleachers record, I feel like on there it's such a step down artistically. And I feel like with Taylor, he's going back into that sort of modern 80s style of production. He's trying to utilize the trends that he was using for his Bleachers records, and it just simply doesn't work. It comes across as very disjointed and just very bizarre, especially contrasted with Taylor's 
obviously very pop forward and very forward thinking pop sensibilities of writing. Um, I just simply don't think that he is a perfect match, and which is why I prefer Desner whenever he was working in the folklore. I don't know how connected uh, Antonoff was to Evermore. I didn't get around to looking at that. So I don't know. That's kind of my two cents on Antonoff because I do feel like he gets a, a little bit overhated nowadays because back in like 2014, 2015, he was doing very good things. I just think by this point, he... Like you're saying, maybe he's too easy to work with because he's becoming a bit or one trick pony, you would say. I think, well, first off, it's interesting because I mentioned the Lana records because I think Kemp Trails Over the Country Club is a contender for her best record. Um, I think I think it sounds great. Um, I, I think there, it is a fair point that <clears throat> Antonoff, like many people, um, has his era, his sound, and is kind of stuck in it and is going to be stuck in it. And at least for me, I don't think it's noticeable enough for me to where I have an issue with it. I can under, like, I can totally see, yeah, I can, it makes sense that like Midnight's is drawing from similar influences to something like 1989 even, which was made eight years prior. You know, I can understand that it's taken from some of those same um, drawing from those same wells, but it's not quite like aggressive enough of a difference to where I mind it yet. I think give it a, give it a few more years, and if he's still doing that, then I might be more willing to chat. Um, I I will say though, I I think the um. Yeah, I think there's also something to be said, like, oh, he's just kind of working with his buddies at this point, like he's everybody's friend and he's not going to, I don't know, move the needle, like maybe that doesn't make for the most inspiring artistic collaboration because, you know, it's the idea you want people to challenge each other or whatever, but I don't know, I think it is nice um, just sometimes when, you know, friends collaborate to make music and it's just doing it in a very, from a very wholesome place. Um, which again, I think is where he comes from. But anyways, um, my number four, 2020's Folklore, five stars. That means, you know what that means. Uh, <laughs> I have four or five star Taylor Swift albums. Um, We'll get to we'll get to midnights later. Um, we'll see how much later, but um, but folklore specifically. This was my number one. As recently as last year, this was my number one. Um, it was a contender from basically the first time that I heard it. Um, between that and one other record, um, I think what changed since then is just kind of me being more honest with myself that even though it is a major change in sound uh, in some ways, that in a way it's also just kind of the darker cousin of Lover production wise and in terms of sequencing. Again, I think with Folklore, a lot of the weakest songs are kind of piled together at the end and cause the album to end on a lower note than where it started from. Now that said, that's the only gripe I have. Um, so Antonov comes back for this record. He is joined and kind of superseded by Aaron Dessner. And um, Dessner obviously has his sound, his established sound from the then, you know, almost 20 years that the National had existed at that time. Um, and because of that, I think that causes Antonov to get moodier in his soundscapes as well. Um, and there is a lot of melancholy beauty in the, the Antonov songs. I think, what, it's half a dozen Antonov songs on that record. Um, Mirrorball, oh my God, I could go on about that one. I think that is staggering. Um, a production triumph, one of Antonov's best production moments as far as I'm concerned, and one of the best produced songs in Taylor's career with that really shimmering darkness. Um, and the song songwriting itself, I think, is terrific. And then the song Illicit Affairs, um, that moment near the end where it segues into the don't call me kid, don't call me baby section, I think is an absolute gut punch moment. I love the 
kind of vocal layering that she's doing. Taylor does kind of the high harmony and then there's a lower harmony that I believe is actually Antonoff singing. Um, it's a very, uh, Tori Amos does this a lot on Little Earthquakes, which is one of my favorite albums of all time. And I think that's just a very super effective um, a way to like approach vocal layering, I guess. I don't know. It just, it, it, it resonates with me. So I think Antonoff's songs <clears throat> are really strong on this record. But Destiner's the star of the show. Um, he dips into his national repertoire with that muted piano sound on songs like Mad Woman or on the two Lana Del Rey inspired songs, um, the song Cardigan, which has this fantastic, like, you know, clip clop horse like percussion sound that could define a song all by itself. I think. I think that that beat makes it in a lot of ways. And then the song Seven, which I think is achingly wistful i love how the piano and vocals play off of each other in that kind of identical register um there's also like a, i think a synth sound or a percussive beat or something that also plays in there and they go back and forth so so well it's just a little thing that i connect with so strongly um it might be my favorite track on the record if i'm being honest um and then sometimes you have kind of the more um, the big Red Machine influences coming out a little bit. Songs like The Last Great American Dynasty, which has this pulsing beat that backs up one of Taylor's most bard-like lyrics, I guess you could say, telling the story of this rich socialite in a very troubadour-like fashion. Dare I say it, a little bit Dylan-esque in how self-defeating she is in this. Um, because at the end of the day, like she's telling the story of this rich person that she's kind of comparing herself to that person um so she's not doesn't go easy on herself in that song i don't think so that's um i think that's interesting and then of course the other half of big red machine is literally on the album justin vernon performing as bony bear on exile um, going into his lower register which is um phenomenal i think people forget that justin vernon is this like mountain of a man who's like six foot four and has this really like low baritone voice and he really digs into its recesses there Exile at its core is a very simple song. I'm pretty sure that piano part was literally written by Taylor's boyfriend, Joe Alwyn. Um, and, but it has a really desolate lyrical subject and that bridge section, which I'm pretty sure is what like Vernon's contribution from a songwriting standpoint comes straight out of um, the Bon Iver album, My Comma I, as far as I'm concerned, I hear a lot of parallels there. I remember being so excited when I heard about this collaboration, you know, 24 hours before the album came out and it did not disappoint. It's still one of my, still a highlight for me. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention August, which is one of the most lover-like tracks here with this really kind of sunny chorus or the really somber Antonov tracks, My Tears Ricochet and This Is Me Trying, which feel cut from the same cloth, but don't feel repetitive either. They feel like two kind of different stages of grief. My Tears Ricochet is kind of in the middle of the process. This is me trying is kind of a bit further along as the person tries to kind of cope with that grief. Um, once it gets to around kind of mad woman, um, give or take, or epiphany, um, the album hits a bunch of more stagnant tracks. They're all still very good, but the rhythms and textures really slow down. And because they're all slow songs, apart from Betty, Betty is the one huge exception, super jubilant, super upbeat. Um, but otherwise, it's a lot of very slow songs that really just kind of bring everything to, um, not to a halt. That's very harsh. I still like Epiphany. I still like Peace. I still like Hopes. But um, it does kind of slow the momentum a bit more than maybe I would like. But even then, I love the piano in Mad Woman. I also like the little kind of twinkles and flourishes that Destner does in Hoax as well. Um, and I really like the bonus track, The Lakes. Um, so, I mean, it's, again, like I said with Lover, we're in nitpicking territory. So this is still five stars for me. I think sonically, this is a phenomenal album. And the songwriting here is close to her best songwriting. I would, it's not her best because there's at least one more where I think the actual songwriting is better. But I think you know what that is, and we will get to it in due time. Five stars for Folklore.
What do you want me to say about it? How do I respond? You've you've truly talk, left you've truly left me perplexed. Let's talk about folklore. Let's let's focus on folklore. We'll we, we'll forget about the other album for now until it turns up. No, no. Maybe at number one. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. Maybe at number one. Yeah. Fuck you. No. I, I have I have enough faith in you to not do bad to me. Perhaps misguided, but we'll see. And number four is going to be Reputation. Um, this album has a very poor reputation. But now I'm just go me. Uh, critically. Critically panned, most fans, from what I gather, weren't really feeling the change in direction, and it made Todd in the Shadows top 10 worst songs of 2017. Twice. Um, yet, I find myself enjoying this album a fair bit, uh, bar none her darkest record overall. This was far into the drama with Mr. Kanye West, and this was her, in many ways, almost embracing the villain in some spots, notably the singles. Um, and it does come across rather awkward for her. She doesn't really, I don't feel like she properly knows how to portray this character, which is weird because she's often in the earlier stuff, you know, fighting against who are these villains within her storylines. And yet she's not necessarily as great writing from the villain's perspective in and of itself. However, I really enjoy that. I've always really liked Look What You Made Me Do. And I think Ready For It is really good as well. Although this album is very similar to 1989, just the darker synth pop approach. Similar to what I said to you earlier, 1989 is like an erasure record. All this is more like Depeche Mode, is kind of whatever I was getting. And there are some weaker moments. We obviously disagree. I think Ed Sheeran kills Endgame. Past that, I really like the song. My other favorites were I Did Something Bad, Delicate, So It Goes, Getaway Car, and New Year's Day. However, I find it incredibly interesting that you bring up a more soulful, a more sort of R&B laden direction when I think perhaps the complete opposite about this record. To me, this reads as an incredibly darker, more experimental record. It's almost as if a modern producer got a hold of something in PC music or a hyper pop record and were molding that to try and sell within a modern pop lens. I think notably on a track like Look, Look What You Made Me Do, with obviously the interpolation of uh, Right Said Fred and the more upfront sort of drum and bass. I think that that's probably the best example of that. But there are other moments on the record that I do get that interpretation from. And I think that it's incredibly interesting. And to be blunt, I wish that more of the record sounded like that. I'm a massive fan of that. My favorite record of 2020 is Black Dresses, uh, Peaceful as Hell. So that kind of shows you how far into that I'm willing to go. Despite that, though, I think that this is an really interesting record. I don't think that it necessarily gets enough credit for how daring and how unique within her catalog it is. Although I can certainly admit that I understand why people aren't as into it. Uh, give the program, though, dog. Uh, this is on the borderline of three and a half and four. But I think I lean closer to four. I think it's a really good pop record that is incredibly misunderstood for what it's worth. Number four, reputation. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, it's interesting. I think based off of what we had talked about before, and I knew you were higher on it, this is about where I expected you to have reputation, so I'm not really surprised. Um, yeah, again, I think the R&B influence piece, I don't even know how much it comes out. Again, I hear it in Endgame, hardcore, but um. And I, I, I honestly hear it and look what you made me do even. Um, but I think some of that also is maybe from like the context of like reading up in it. Like that's the, that's the music that she was like taking influence from and that she has cited as an inspiration. I do agree it doesn't come through on a lot of the songs. And I think, I don't, I would, I mean, I wouldn't say that there was like a, any sort of like PC music inspiration here. Um, I don't, um, I don't know if, how into that type of stuff she she is, if at all. But I, um, I would expect not. I think it's very much coincidence, and more so me projecting that more than likely. But yeah, yeah, it could be. It could be. Um, I'm glad you mentioned "Ready for It." "Ready for It" is another one of those like really over the top ones that I 
yep. didn't did not like it all at first, but this one actually grew on me a lot. Um, nice. Probably more than any other song on the record. Out in the Shadows, number one worst song of 2017. Yeah. yeah. Poor Tom. Poor Tom. <laughs> <laughs> All right, top three. Uh, what what does what does uh, Mister Mister William Schmilliam say? This is our metal spots, our podium uh, yes. spots. We're, we're uh, at the medals in your yeah. bronze position. Yes, bronze position. I'm going to yeah. end your I'm going to end your suffering. 2022's Midnight's is my number three. What makes you think that's going to end the suffering? You have it at five stars. I I think if I'm I, in utter agony. If I put it at number one, I think we wouldn't be able to upload this video yes i'd go into cardiac arrest because your head your head would explode and not only would <clears throat> you be dead and unable to upload the video but at that point we would probably get it taken down from youtube for being uh age inappropriate content no they're fine so, they're smart for adults anyway so yeah. it's all good maybe maybe we get a lot of hits on like live leak or one of those like we, awful we, things we have a good tmz interview let's say that or you would yeah, anyway i would, you would i would yeah um but anyways, Midnight's, five stars, number three. On first listen, I probably would have ranked this as my number nine. I still would have had it above the self-titled, but probably not above anything else. I thought the lyrics were her weakest in a long time, and the songs themselves were to one note, uh, kind of all across the board. Uh, but now we're here. And... Some of that, I, I mean, I have to be honest, anyway, it's a transparent moment. I, I, some of it's kind of exposure therapy, if you will. My, the friends of mine who have gotten me into, the one who got me into Taylor Swift initially and the one who kind of helped make her become like an all-time favorite for me, jammed this really frequently when it came out. So even though I heard it the first time and I was like, nah, I'm okay, not really listening to this much ever again, I kind of had to. And I think eventually after listening to songs, you become, especially when it's like in those settings, like you become more inclined to think positively of them because you have good memories associated with them. Um, but beyond that, I think this album feels like a worthy successor to Reputation, um, again, because of that overlap with kind of the ideas and where it's coming from. And if anything, I think it pulls off the darker paranoia of reputation way better. It's, it's not as caught up in the tabloid gossip so much as it's connected to Taylor's own visions, her, I mean, her nightmares, I suppose, because the whole concept behind this is her describing 12 sleepless nights over the course of her life, I guess. Um, so it, feel, it feels more personal. It feels like I mean, maybe the most personal album that she's ever released connected to her own emotions, her own experiences. 100% um, Jack Antonoff produced record, technically the first 100% Antonoff produced album, I think. Um, I don't think he does every song I love her. I could be wrong. Um, Aaron Dessner does some of the bonus tracks on this one. Easily my favorite of those is Would Have, Could Have, Should Have, which is this angry, like almost country rock track about an abusive relationship that's as good of a vocal as she's ever put down i think it's a fantastic song um so if you don't like the rest of the album at least check that song out that's my recommendation if you haven't um and i think compared to lover the production from antonoff on the main album of midnight's feels a bit less excited I think there's a lot of lover tracks where Antonov kind of throws a bag of tricks and sound effects out there because it's optimistic and we want to be kind of peppy and um, stuff like that. <clears throat> the only time he really does that here is on the song Bejeweled, which is so over the top that just in terms of like its lyrics that you couldn't realistically get away with being subtle in any way. For the record, I love like the kind of synth arpeggios in the chorus. And I think that's that's where I think it connects to some of like the more kind of wacky um, reputation production moments. Otherwise, you have songs like the really super lush Snow on the Beach, which is a Lana Del Rey impression that Lana also guests on, although I think it's a stretch to call her a feature since her backing vocals are mixed really far in the background. 
um, or the song Midnight Rain, which mixes these late 80s kind of ice water synths with these this kind of pitch shifted vocal hook that works way better than it should. Um, they do a few things with pitch shifting on this record here and there, like on the song Labyrinth, which reminds me actually of some of those ending folklore tracks at first with kind of how subdued it is, but then picks up a bit when the chorus comes in. Really the only track on here that's kind of a dud still for me, but it's still grown on me is Vigilante Shit, which to me, it, I'm, I don't know. It kind of sounds like a Billie Eilish impression, but maybe it's more fair to say that it's Jack Antonoff doing a really tame impression of Phineas. Um, I don't know. I still like You Should See Me in a Crown more, but the line lately I've been dressing for revenge is pretty savage, I have to admit. Um, speaking of lyrics, let's get to anti-hero. Uh, sorry, anti-hero. Try to pronounce it like I'm British or some shit. Um, it's sort of a bizarre word salad that on the one hand contains that sexy baby lyric, which feels very intentionally provocative. And I'm, I'm still not sure if I really like what she's trying to do. Like there's a point there, but I don't, and I know she chose that. I'm sure she chose that line to kind of catch people's eyes. Like, what the fuck is she talking about? But I still don't know if I love it or anything. But then there's that line, did you hear my covert narcissism disguised as altruism, like some kind of congressman lyric, which I just... I love it's a bonkers lyrical choice for a pop song especially one that hit number one and is now like one of her most successful singles of all time like it's so odd how you work that into a into a hit song like that I think the chorus is what really sets it apart and I think you kind of spoke to it actually it's like one of the few positive things you had to say it's one of her best hooks in a long time and again you have that kind of me against the world theme that she was exploring in reputation but this time it feels more connected to self-esteem issues so i think that makes her in a lot of people's eyes feel more sympathetic and i think that's why midnight's has been way more successful critically than reputation has um and i suppose commercially too um it's i mean what what you said at the outset is true and i think it's really interesting that we are doing this video now because I don't know if Taylor Swift is ever going to be as popular again as she is right now in this moment. Um, it's kind of bizarre. Someone on my Twitter feed described it as like Taylor mania is what's going on. Like she is front page tabloid news, I guess, but just front page entertainment news on a daily basis. Um, and I mean, and on some levels, yeah, it's tabloid shit, but on some levels, I suppose it makes sense. And I mean, you think of the tour that she's on right now, like I read full disclosure, I'm going to the tour in about another month, which I'm really excited for. I wasn't sure what to expect before, but then when I saw the set list and she's performing 44 fucking songs per show, which is insane. Um, like for context, people give Bruce Springsteen like credit for performing really long shows and his songs his shows are like 28 songs long or something like that. Like the closest like analog I have to that is something like Paul McCartney when I saw him. Yeah, there you go. There you go. He's a great live performer, not distant Springsteen at all, but it's more so like, you know, his shows are like 28 songs. Closest I've seen to Taylor's numbers like Paul McCartney, you know, who does like 38, 40 songs on his current tours. Um, but yeah, 44 is like unheard of. So bottom line is she's huge right now um so i think it's very interesting that we are doing this video in this moment but back to midnight's best hook on the album in my opinion is karma which i think is one of her very best hooks ever both in the verse and in the chorus i love the way that she emphasizes the line the word burned in that first verse that little kind of vocal turn that she does and that explosion into the chorus is just the absolute shit. It's so gloriously 80s. It reminds me of the best of 1989. I adore every second of this song. And even on first listen, I knew that. So maybe I have this song to thank as well for getting me into the rest of the album because at least I wanted to revisit this. Um, yeah, I haven't acknowledged Lavender Haze. I think that opens the album with confidence, has that really airy head voice chorus I think is great. You're on your own kid, which addresses her eating disorder issues um, in what's probably as raw and personal of a way as she's ever been outside of like her relationship struggles. Or the song Sweet Nothing, which is just a goddamn cute romance number with those saxophones and other brass instruments that again, I think kind of sound borrowed from some of Boney Bear's recent stuff. I don't know. 
I guess I understand where people have come away from this album feeling disappointed. I'm staring one of them in the face right now, but I think it's one of the biggest growers in her catalog. And I think it does represent a maturity and confidence that she hasn't had in some of her previous work and a lot of her previous work uh, that I think is inspiring. So yeah, from maybe two and a half, yeah, I mean, probably like three stars first listen to five stars now by number three, 2022's Midnights. Okay. Let me try and process this shit. Come at me. Come at me. I have nothing but respect for you. I'm glad that you enjoy it as much as you do. Thank you. To be as blunt as I can, I didn't agree with a single word of what you said, even remotely a little bit. Um, and that's okay. Uh, I think you forgot I was saying how much I hate the chorus in Antihero. I think that it is vile. No good. And I actually think with how glowingly you talk about it, I like the record less. But chum, hey, I'm so glad that you enjoy it. I, I know that that sounds terrible on my end. Did you? Okay. But I, th- I thought you did praise something about Antihero. Was it like the instrumental? I, I like the instrumental affair. Okay. That's what I was thinking of then. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think lyrically it's hot garbage. But like, genuinely, I hate it. And I get what she's going for. I just think that she is approaching it with an extreme lack of subtlety that it just, it almost feels as if she's posing across midnights. There is a, there is a bit of an I'm so clever type of thing, I think, that's going on, um, which bothers me sometimes i think maybe if i was in a more negative mood towards the record at this stage you know at this point of time i would be bothered by it more but um at least right now i don't really care too much it's all good it's all i will say i am very gracious that this is one of her few records that are in now that that is the kindest thing i can say to that record at this point so uh that's one point over lover uh, number three for me, going to be our last one of overlap that could be 1989. Taylor's dip into modern day synth pop, and I would say a very successful one. This is where I properly bump into four stars. Reputation was kind of on the borderline. Greg Johnson. This one is fully there. Uh, I love the production across this record. Uh, unlike other pop from the era, I think that this is clean, this is perfection. Everything flows in brilliantly with nothing ever sticking out. And while it's blatantly a weaker set of songs than Red, it's still a good batch of tracks. Blank Space is, yeah, the Blank Space is a great opener. Not an opener, a great single. The style is just absolutely fantastic. I love Out of the Woods. I think that song just gets stuck in my head. All you had to do was stay, really excellent. And I absolutely adore Wildest Dreams. I think that is one of her best songs. Uh, I will admit Shake It Off and Bad Blood were never very good. I actually used to kind of like both of these songs, but uh, yeah, no, I've I've atoned. I've realized their flaws. Notably, the uh, I could point out the rap in Shake It Off as being the notably awful part, but I feel like the worst part of either of those songs is how bad blood has aged because as much as i love the production across this record i think having a song that's essentially addressing your feud with Katy perry has not aged very well in the sense of Katy perry not aging at all basically because she was dead by this point already so that being said however i think that this is a very great shift in direction for taylor and i do agree that it's her most poppy up to this point, and I think that she approaches it in a very nice way, showing a bit more depth to her as an artist. And for me, it's just a very fun listen. I have it at four stars for 1989. Um, yeah. I don't know if Katy Perry was quite dead, quite dead, figuratively speaking, in 2014. I feel like Witness, that album, was what really just kind of ended her in the popular limelight it was but i'd say she was already getting there after what was the record before them prism uh yes question mark yeah because that one already had the weaker singles once again todd machado's woo 
right? Whenever your biggest hit from that record was Dark Horse, I feel like you could inevitably tell if there was going to be a shift in yeah. how much longstanding popularity she had. Yeah, no, she was she was never going to last, I don't think. I am yeah. partial to the singles of hers more so than, again, I think a lot of other music enthusiasts, hardcore ones are, but... I agree. The singles um, on uh, Teenage Dream are great. Yeah. Is that the name of the record? I forget. Yeah. Also, shout out to Clay Jones, though. So, yeah. Um, 1989 is my number two. Okay. Five stars. Um, yeah, like you said, it's the big, it's the big pop pivot. Um, she's getting there with Red. Um, but on this one, country gets left behind almost entirely, apart from traces here and there. Like the big one, obviously, being This Love, which is the last time we hear our old production friend our producer friend, Nathan Chapman. Um, he comes back for that and then we never see him again. Um, <clears throat> and the result of this is one of the most controversial stylistic changes in recent memory for an artist of her caliber. Now, if this was full of a bunch of I Knew You Were Trouble-like tracks with those dubstep drops, I'd probably put this relatively low on the list. Um, I think if it was just a bunch of those types of songs, um, it would have aged pretty poorly overall. Um, but Max Martin and Shellback, who produced the vast majority of this record, take a very different approach to these ones. Um, they, utilize, they utilize this more synth pop forward sound that draws from a lot of obvious 80s influences. Um, I find it interesting that apparently I think it was Taylor herself who cited Peter Gabriel as an influence from this record. Um, I can hear pieces of it in the production at times, I think. That's what I'll say. Um, but I do think that's really interesting. And I think, again, speaks to her being a more eclectic music listener than she is given credit for sometimes. Um, <clears throat> the opening song, Welcome to New York, I think in some ways still sounds connected to Red from a songwriting approach. Um, so product, production wise, I think it's different, but I think from like, if you strip it down a little bit, I could see it fitting on red. So right away, I'm not quite blown away by the difference between those two albums, but then you get to blank space and it becomes evident. We have entered entirely different territory. I think blank space is a terrific pop song. One of her best number one hits and easily the best of like the huge singles from this record. Um, Shake It Off is sort of a fun bop in the mold of like 22. I think the low synth brass sound that's everywhere is kind of just hilarious in a derpy sort of way. Um, and admittedly, Bad Blood is one of my least favorite Taylor Swift tracks from a songwriting perspective. It feels pretty underdeveloped in that way, but I can deal with it here. I think her vocals are quite good and end up saving again what I think is fundamentally kind of a weak song. Style is an all-timer for me. Um, that pulsing guitar leading into the synth break um, kind of reminds me, I guess, of Karma and how the chorus kind of washes all over you. Uh, credit to uh, Ali Payami, I think is how you say his name, of uh, the person who wrote Can't Feel My Face by The Weeknd. Uh, he wrote kind of the core of that song. Um, so major credit to him for that. He also um, wrote or helped write Ready For It. Um, really, yeah, I know two completely different songs. Really, every song sounds stunning, um, super clear in a way that I just cannot get enough of as far as 2010's pop albums go. There's a ton going on. Like most, if not all, these songs have a lot of like components to the production, but it's not overwhelming in the same kind of loudness war sort of way that her early albums are. And I think that describes a lot of like Max Martin's very best production moments. I think he is at his finest here. It ranks among the finest things that he's ever done. Um, so major, major credit to him. Uh, Ryan Tedder and Jack Antonoff both get moments in the sun from a production standpoint. I don't think that Tedder's style sounds supernatural for her, but Antonoff again does what I think he does best by giving his collaborators these kind of warm beds of sound that are comfortable for them to the point where you could almost accuse him of sounding anonymous, which is funny for me to say that because then you have Out of the Woods, which is one of the most chaotic mixes of the bunch, 
yet Taylor sounds so comfortable kind of chanting over the top of it. I know I kind of talked about um, that one compared to uh, Getaway Car. Um, and admittedly, Out of the Woods doesn't have much of a melody to it, at least in the choruses, but I do think it sounds really cool um, with those kind of process, like, you know, again, Antonoff singing kind of layered in the background um, and then Swift kind of layering her vocals on top of it. It's just, it's cool. It's cool. Um, is it a weaker lyrical album than most of her others? Yeah. And you could argue that it's not playing to her strengths because of that. But I don't think that kind of confessional descriptive style that she's known for would translate super well to this type of songwriting. And I would not trade these hooks and this production sound for the world. Um, there's still some strong moments. Wildest Dreams is a really stunning song. I think by any measure, it's just so wistful and frozen in time. Maybe it's just me. Sometimes the vocal approach gives me Lord vibes. Um, but yeah, I love that one. And the ending track, Clean. Um, Imogen Heap collaboration. I adore Imogen Heap. I think she is a phenomenally creative musician that contains some of her typically like eclectic percussion sounds and lyrical ideas. Maybe my favorite production on the whole album somehow. I mean, it's hard to top Max Martin, but Imogen Heap gives them a run for their money with those layered vocals, those, if you know what boom whackers are, those fucking boom whackers that add those like percussive sounds, um, they are combined in such an ethereal way. It just closes everything off so well. Um, I would probably say that I feel like this might be the best pop album of the 2010s, um, which I don't think it's that controversial of a take because of how massive it is. I mean, it is really that decade's version of Thriller um, as far as how omnipresent so much of it is. Um, but I just think from a technical standpoint, these songs sound incredible. I think the hooks are fire just front to back and um yeah, I think it represents what I love most about pop music and the combination of catchy hooks with just this attention to detail and this like construction of these mixes that I think is just so fascinating. Um, and somehow, somehow, it is only my number two. So we'll wait and see what I have to say about number one. I thought that you had a solid case there for 1989. But then I remembered one little record. And nope, no, you are you are you are out of your depths. But I understand, I understand. But do, we, do, we, do I get to know what that one little record is? Yeah, I guess. Uh Joanne Lady Gaga. It's way. I love that record though. It's not even my it's not even my favorite Gaga record, if I'm being honest. It's probably my number two. Well, yeah, I, I know you're one of those fan monster fellas. It's probably my number two, but I might I also definitely say that I like art pop more, but I know that's gonna be contentious. I love art pop though. So oh well, we'll get there. We'll get there. Yeah. Number two, top two. Interesting match, because you've already talked about them both. Feel like where I'm going is obvious, but wasn't obvious to me going into this because I had, for lack of a better term, kind of poo pooed on the other record and had always spoken very highly of what I had at number two. However, I was strongly taken aback by one of these records on this listen. At number two for me, it's going to be Red, meaning folklore is my name. But shake up your initial guess. Uh, for me, this is clearly her best record up to this point. Her most consistent set of songs with a great pop influence across here. Her lyrics are just growing more and more, as well as the arrangements. It's a far more diverse set of tracks here, incorporating rock, pop, full country. Just a bunch more styles than what she was doing previously. But the opening song, State of Grace, is probably to this day her best opener. And I think it's just absolutely sensational. Uh, the title track is lovely. I knew you were trouble in 22 are both excellent pop numbers. Uh, they're kind of holding it back. I absolutely love that little dubstep influence on I knew you were trouble. It is the perfect amount. Um, I wanted to ask you, do you prefer the remix? Because I know they toned it down, like on the red version. Uh no, no, I don't. Okay, good. Thank you. 
so I can do a ask that. Anyways, I'm moving forward, forward from there. Um, all too well is good, but probably not even in like the top half of the record. Uh, great vocal performance, but um, I think the arrangement is a bit overstated. And who don't get me started on that 10 minute version because I have thoughts. Um, my favorites actually come in within the back half of the record. Uh, the last time I think is incredible. My favorite of the duets across here. And the closer, Begin Again, is just utterly sensational. I might go as far as to say Begin Again might be my favorite Taylor Swift song. And if I'm really feeling daring, it might be my favorite song of 2012, but I'll have to look at that in the future. Um, there are some weaker moments on here. Notably, Stay, 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 I think is a bit too jaunty, a bit too sort of playful for the record's own good. And you're right, Everything Has Changed is not great, but it's definitely the best thing that Ed Sheeran has had to do with Taylor Swift. So I will take it. But past that, there, there's just 14 really strong to great pop tracks here. Have to four and a half. I think that this is a great pop record that I cannot fathom how you have this at number seven. I, um, yeah, I just don't even understand that. Especially knowing from how much you love Taylor Swift, I think it was just so blatantly one of her peaks. But I'll, I'll give you the floor. Great album. You. Yeah. I, I actually want to throw it back to you because I do want to hear, I do want to get you started on the 10 minute version of All Too Well. Like let's, let's, throw, let's throw it out there. What do, you, what, do you, what do you think? I just think it's too much. I don't think that the arrangement really, I don't think that the arrangement lends to the 10 minutes. I don't think that she's really elevating the track. I think that she says more with less than on the 10-minute version. I feel like she's almost trying too hard to cross the line. Like she's adding these moments that really don't need to be there. And if you're wanting to get this man like canceled again, I mean, that's fine. But it's like, I feel like she did an elegant enough job, and I feel like it's a much tighter overall track with the five-minute version. I And I think it's another one of those cases where people were just acting like the 10 minute version is like the apex of music. And it's like the number one of anything in the modern pop sphere. I gather it, it just got absolute rapturous praise. And I just, I listened to it before once or twice and I just don't really see how it's that much an improvement. And for me, it personally detracts from the overall of that song. So that's my stance. Crucify me all you like. Well, I think that one's hard because I no, I don't prefer it to the original version um, because I do think that ultimately the extra five minutes that she adds on is weaker material than what she had to start off with. Um, I The value that I see in that is kind of I, I see value in it as like a kind of, I don't know, a fragment. Like I, I kind of see it as almost as like a demo. Um, it's not a demo, obviously, because she re-recorded and completed it like with these words that she had before. But I mean, apparently I have not heard it. I don't remember if it's like publicly accessible. If you hear like the, there is a rehearsal tape of her, playing that song with the band that full 10 minute version exactly how she recorded it there so um i think it's interesting to hear that kind of you know work in progress version or what it would have sounded had it not been cut down and i i do think lyrically i think lyrically it elevates it the 10 minute version i think there's some really like um even more kind of jagged stuff um and some really good kind of wordplay and stuff that um, I'm really happy that we got to hear. But yeah, and no, I don't think that it is superior to the five minute version. And I'm glad that because the 10 minute version was released that allowed, I think the greater public to properly put all too well on the pedestal that I think it should be placed on as possibly her best song. Um, where did it, I have to, I'm not going to look it up right now. I know that Rolling Stone put it in like the top 
50 or whatever the greatest songs of all time now which is um i think it was top 50 let me let me just check i like all too well i think it's a very good song but oh, oh my goodness top 50 all time i think even you can admit to a certain degree Number that seems a bit excessive 69 69 is where it ranked nice um one of looks like yeah one of two songs blank space was number 357 long space should be higher but in any case uh i don't know i think i think it makes sense to have a taylor song pretty high at this point given her lengthy career and i can understand why they chose all too well as the option that's where i sit on it i get it if you're going for a more artistic perspective but from what I think is a better overall constructed song and what I think in general is better representative of her as an artist currently, mm-hmm. I would probably go with style. I think that that is pretty much an excellently perfectly crafted pop song. Which I feel like that is where people view her. Well, maybe when they redo the list again in 10 yeah. years, um, maybe Antihero will be in the top 10. So anyways, all right, enough tangents. Um, Let's get to my number one Um, and let me gush about the fantastic Evermore, five stars. Um, So use this as an excuse if you made it this far, plugging my YouTube channel, Music Deep Dive. I did a video on a bunch of musical works, 12 musical works that have a great deal of meaning to me. Um, it's in the thumbnail of that video, so I'm okay spoiling it, but Evermore is one of the things that I talk about. Um, again, it wasn't my number one originally. I remember when I first listened to it, kind of thinking, yeah, this is Folklore 2.0, and I prefer Folklore, et cetera, et cetera. But after revisiting it, especially over the last year or so, I don't think calling it Folklore 2.0 is accurate. I, I understand that, again, it's easy to silo the two together because they're two, the two Aaron Dessner albums. So far, the two Aaron Dessner albums, hoping for more, obviously. But um, I don't think they sound like they're coming from the same type of artistic place. Um, <clears throat> and apart from the guitars in Willow sounding actually quite a bit like those in Invisible String, this album stands out sonically to me. It's less dark and less kind of hazy than and keyboard centric, I guess, than folklore is more guitar centric, I think. Um, yeah, it stands on its own. I think you can thank two people for that. Those being Aaron Dessner and Taylor Swift herself. First off, Dessner, he gets the reins for every song on this album, apart from Gold Rush, which is Jack Antonoff. Um, Antonov was a very busy guy around this time. He was helping Lana with chemtrails, Lord with solar power, and St. Vincent with Daddy's Home all at this time. So presumably he didn't do more songs because he just was stretched thin. Um, and Gold Rush, I it's one of my least favorites on the album technically, which isn't saying all that much because I love every song. And I, I do think it's one of his most beautiful kind of ethereal production jobs overall. Um, but going back to Desner, he really goes to work creating all of these super kind of organic sounding tracks with a lot of these really great guitar sounds, both acoustic and electric, um, layering those guitars too. He's got a bunch of guitars going all at once. Like even in Willow, I'm pretty sure there's like four different guitars going or something. Um, there's that muted piano. That's kind of like one of his trademark sounds um, or dampened, I think is the proper word, putting like the damper pedal on the piano. Um, And then these really like live sounding vocals, Uh, Taylor recorded all of these vocals at his studio, I believe, rather than at her home studio. Um, So I think that contributes to the song sounding a bit more unified too. Um, But yeah, there's um, the other thing too, and this is true of folklore as well, is that some of these songs are actually national outtakes. Um, Willow was going to be a national song for sure. 
Closure was going to be a big Red Machine song, which we'll talk about. Um, so, and I think um, Cardigan from Folklore as well was going to be a national song originally. Um, but Dessner didn't know what to do with it. So he kind of just sent the demo to Taylor and was like, what do you, what, what do you want to do with it? And then she wrote Cardigan. So there's that. Um, there's other notable features on this record, more, more than on the previous one. Justin Vernon comes back on the title track, which closes the album. And I love the duetting back and forth in that bridge section that he does with Taylor. It's super effective, really using that falsetto effectively. Um, but Vernon's also in quite a few other songs, but less kind of um, at the forefront. He He's the one who contributes that those wild electronic drum programming and closure. Again, a big red machine left over. Probably my least favorite on the song because I think or on the album because I think it sounds a little bit out of place compared to everything else, but I don't mind it too much still. I still think it's a four-star song, probably. And then Vernon also um, he does the backing vocals in Ivy. Really love that acoustic track. Um, again, another one where I think the bridge is fantastic. That's the thing. After that first album, Taylor Swift really figured out how to write bridges effectively and figured it out quickly. I think she is one of the most interesting bridge writers that I've heard in popular music. So I think that's another point in her point in her favor for me. Uh, so again, Ivy, Vernon does the backing vocals there, which I love. And then he's also playing those live drums on the song Cowboy Like Me, um, which has this like huskier vocal delivery from Taylor that gives me hella Fleetwood Mac vibes, if I'm being honest. I really get like a classic mid-70s Fleetwood Mac sound there. Um, also some nice backing vocals from Marcus Mumford of all people here. Um, not a big Mumford and Sons fan, but he's pretty, he, he melds well um, in this sort of anonymous way. The band Heim guests on Nobody No Crime, which is this kind of ode to true crime enthusiasts, if you will, that works thanks to its kind of corny over the top lyrics and that groove. Heim are really good instrumentalists, especially SD Heim on the bass. She has such a strong sense of like pocket and really makes that song kick. I do prefer the song Gasoline that Heim released with Taylor featured on that. Um, and that one actually has a fantastic bass line. I was listening to it before we did this, but um, Nobody, No Crime is still great. And then probably not surprising, there's a song with the national properly on here, Coney Island. I don't think, I actually don't think Taylor plays off of Matt Berninger as naturally as some of the other collaborators, but holy shit, the instrumental makes up for everything. All of those like acoustic guitars that kind of just slowly come in piece by piece along with those percussive noises, the piano adding warmth to everything, then the strings start entering kind of in that first chorus and just builds and builds and builds to add this padding. Oh man, I just, I love Destner's production in so many ways. So yeah, he does well here and he's a highlight, but Taylor's songwriting is on a level on this album that I don't think she's reached before. She really embraces her storytelling side creating these narratives that are sometimes based off of real life, but sometimes are totally fictional. Um, I, I was mortally offended that you put Tolerated as one of your least favorites. Um, I, that's one of my absolute favorites. That piano track in 5-4 time with a super haunting chorus with some really nice low harmonies by Taylor in there. Again, like I said, she's really aged into her voice well. Love it when she explores that darker lower range. That song is just based off a book. I believe it's based off the book, Rebecca. But she still sells it as if it was a personal thing. So you could be forgiven for thinking it was a personal narrative. Uh, kind of like Kate Bush does with Wuthering Heights, but way more muted and less fantastical than what Kate does. Uh, Champagne Problems, sort of a spiritual successor to All Too Well, for one thing, because it uses the exact same chords in the exact same order, but also because of its kind of rip the bandaid off description of a marriage proposal gone wrong. Uh, that line, she would have made such a lovely bride. What a shame she's fucked in the head, they said. Definitely an all-time lyric for her. And she has several in that song alone. I think that's a career highlight for her in that department. Tis the Damn Season and Dorothea kind of do this thing she does on Folklore where it's several songs displaying the same relationship from different perspectives. I mean, Folklore, you yeah, have, what is it? Um, Cardigan, Betty, and August are all about the same relationship situation for different perspectives, same type of thing here. 
And both these songs are fantastic. I love the kind of sunny straightforwardness of Dorothea and Tis the Damn Season has this amazing, just like electric guitar part and that kind of spitfire chorus. Um, you have Marjorie, this tribute to her grandmother, Marjorie Finlay, an opera singer, which is beautiful. I love they actually included recordings of Marjorie Finlay towards the end as part of the soundscape. I think it's a really cute gesture. And then maybe the best damn song in the album and maybe the best bit of songwriting of her career. Like at this point, I'd probably say it's my favorite song of hers. And somehow it was only a bonus track, Right Where You Left Me. It takes the speak now country songwriting style um, and updates it for the 2020s. And Taylor kind of takes that lyrical idea because at the end of the day, it's about this person who's never gotten over a breakup. She's still stuck in that same emotional space that she was in years and years ago. Um, and she takes that idea and she messes around with the song structure. It's basically just one slow buildup into like a huge climactic chorus. You have kind of a weird little bridge section. It drops out and then it builds up again. Um, and I think that song just proves that we've come a long way since 2010, since the beginning of her career. And I think she explores these song structures in much more interesting ways. Um, and I'm just a sucker for like buildups like that. I think it's just super, super effective. And yeah, I've name dropped almost every song on the album. Um, Happiness and long story short, I really like both those songs. And I think the bonus track, It's Time to Go, is pretty good. So there you go. I have officially name dropped every single song on Evermore. At this point in my life, I don't know if it's going to stay there. But just from execution, from personal connection, everything, it's a top 10 album for me of all time, maybe top five. Um, I really love it. It really have a personal connection to it. I know me personally, I spent a lot of time just doing like long walks, just listening to this thing, kind of in like a park or something. Um, I feel very strongly about it in a way that I do a few other records. And I think that speaks to the impact that Taylor Swift's music has had on me in a relatively short period of time, frankly. And that's why I wanted to do this video um, to talk about that, to talk about this record and to hopefully kind of turn a few more people onto uh, her music and what I think is her greatness. So Evermore, number one, five stars. All right. I'm glad that you really enjoy it. And I'll be sure to give it another listen because here, here, here's what I'm thinking. They're all produced by Destin. You have the great drum parts and points across here. They're national-esque. And you quite literally have Matt Berenger on it. Uh, at the moment, get rid of Taylor. Make this a national record. Lovely. Ten out of ten. We recommend. <laughs> no. Are you are you saying that um you could picture uh Matt yes. Berenger singing uh Gold Rush? Singing might be a stretch, but yes. Yes. Croaking. the national, but you and I can say that. Yeah, croaking maybe would be a better word. Uh, maybe uh, I don't know. Shout shouts to uh, Dylan CB. Resident national hater. Love you. But anyways, I, I also have to say, I couldn't disagree more. I think that Behringer and Taylor Swift work off each other brilliantly. I've loved the collaboration on the new record between those two. And yes, to, to be fair, I, I just have to bring it up here because it's my what, like second, third least favorite national record. But the duets record of Behringer with all of these different female singers, I think that his voice melts basically every singer pretty much on that record. Perhaps I just like Behringer too much. This is my crux. Yeah, I, I've not, so I've not heard the full new national record. I have heard the Alcott. I do think they work off each other much better in that one. I don't know what throws me off about Coney Island. Maybe it's like, like something about the production in like, in like how Matt's vocal is produced that is like really different than Taylor's vocal. There's I, something I, about it that just clashes a little bit. I think his voice maybe could have been pushed a little bit further back in the mix because he has such a strong vocal in and of itself. Like he's so present. Yeah. Which is kind of what happens on that new national song is Taylor's pushed a bit more further. She kind of takes the reins, which I know that some people have an issue with. I get it. Shout out to you, Vanessa, but I really enjoyed it. So yeah, the Alcott is fantastic. Not as big um, of a fan of the big red machine collapse that she did in the most recent record, but they're still. They're still good. So I need to listen to those records. I'll get around to it. 
get around to it for sure. Anyways, holy shit, we've gone for like at least an hour and a half. That's a less than half the records in Elton. Damn. <laughs> Number one for me. I was I not what I was anticipating at all. I have full board. To be blunt with you, I had this at three stars going into it, and I've listened to it two, three times before already. So this was really just like knock your pants off right here with this listen. Uh, as I mentioned, I've really tried with this record and I just never fully got it. Excuse me. I thought it was decent. And then there were a couple of excellent cuts. But as a full listening experience, I always viewed it being perhaps a tad bloated and maybe even slightly one note. Uh, I was completely taken aback this time. And I think having the full context of her catalog really does elevate it. Um, big thing, though, I'm wearing the goddamn shirt. I'm an absolute huge national super fan. To be blunt, maybe my second, third favorite artist in general. I think that they are just pretty much immaculate. Once again, love you, Dylan. And uh, Aaron Destiny's production qualities across here, uh, they remind me of a ton of Sleep Well Beast, and I just adore that record. With obviously a tad more pop appeal, having this superstar over top of it really helps to recontextualize his work. And I think that's just excellent. Taylor comes out some of her best material here, though. Uh, Cardigan, as you mentioned before, was a national demo, but she's able to sell the song brilliantly and really just elevate it to the forefront. And the last Grand American Dynasty has perhaps her best overall story coming from the catalog. I just absolutely love it. Uh, Exile is not her best duet because I do prefer the last time, but I think that it's so bizarre hearing Justin Vernon sing without this heady sort of vocal distortion and sort of production. I think that they sound brilliant together. Um, my tears rec ricochet and into not track is just absolutely sensational. Really showcasing her really being able to develop out because we haven't really brought it up, but a lot of people discredit Taylor for how often she just sort of writes from the perspective of her being hurt and this man sort of hurting her or affecting her. Where I feel like this is really a point in which she's starting to grow past that and really just showcase how. Sure, she was treated wrongly, but this is her growth through it, and less so, you know, her sort of explaining the situation, if that makes sense, which is kind of how a lot of people perceive those songs. And with all of those being within the first third of the record, are just fantastic. I'm not crazy about Mirrorball. I think that's the primary song that falters from the two different producers. You can expect that strong of a reaction, but okay. Um, I think it's one of the few that you can tell that like Dester and Antonov are separated, which it's a shame. I still like the song. I just think that it's one of the weaker on the record. Um, despite that, though, August, this is me trying and whenever Dessner and uh, Antonov come together on the elegant bedding near the end is, are all delightful songs. And the track Mad Woman has always been a personal favorite of mine. Uh, say what you want about Taylor as a whole, but I feel like this is an incredibly strong artistic statement from somebody who is often cast aside as being a pop star, but she's just so much more. He's pretty much fully taken over in indie folk and pop realm that many artists have done before, and she's able to incorporate it in this authentic and really beautiful sense. And I feel like the pandemic has something to do with that. I feel like just the time of it coming out how it sort of impacted people at the time, really did elevate it. I have this record of four and a half stars. I think it's a great record. And it really grew on me over this listen. So my number one, Folklore, four and a half stars. Probably saw it in my top five for uh, 2020. Then. We'll see. We'll see. I think it's cool. I'm not that surprised that we both had um, Desner albums at number one. Um, yeah, I definitely thought it was going to be Evermore rather than Folklore, um, too. in part because in part because there's less Antonov on Evermore. Yeah. Um, but yeah, very interesting, very interesting discussion. And I'm Absolutely. glad I'm glad that she I'm glad that she grew on you. Um, I think kind of like what I said at the outset. Um, I don't want, to, I'm, I'm not going to be that person who's like, I think Taylor Swift's underappreciated or whatever, because you look at the sheer sizes of her crowds and that's just baloney. But I really, 
I'm trying to speak mainly to like the rate your music core folks, the people who are like um, diehards and really investigate deeply into, you know, just what music is out there, which I think is fantastic. Um, I think we, we all sort of have our kind of like sacred cows as far as like who the supposed greats are, right? As far as songwriting goes, you know, Bob Dylan, right? I mean, kind of everyone, everyone agrees on that one. And then for female songwriters, you know, the, usually the ones you hear about are Kate Bush and uh, Joni Mitchell and people like that. And I think I want to, I guess, just, if nothing else, motivate people to start assessing artists like Taylor Swift kind of in the moment as they're happening and recognizing greatness and popularity as they're happening. I think the types of artistic changes and the type of incredible like mass popularity um, that we're witnessing with Taylor Swift's career is not something you've seen very frequently before. I'm not gonna say it's unprecedented entirely, um, but it is a very, very, very rare thing. And I just hope that people kind of sit with that and appreciate that while it's happening because um, yeah, I think we, we too often ignore, ignore the greats after they're gone. We're recording this on the day that Andy Rourke from the Smiths passed away, for instance, just one example of many, many, many over the years. And so I, I'm using this time to kind of say that I, you know, I'm acknowledging a great, arguably at the height of her greatness, um, at least that's my opinion. And perhaps I can get others to kind of join the bandwagon as well on some level. If Midnight didn't release, I would feel more inclined to agree with what you were saying. However, I think that we are at the downfall of her artistic statements. However, we are at the peak of her commercial engagement, if that makes sense. And I kind of want to turn it off to this in a similar debate of how much longer do you really think that her career is going to sustain the way that it is now? Because I would say that it is pretty much unprecedented for an artist of her caliber to still be around at this time, essentially being ever popular since 2006. How many other artists in the general pop sphere could you really say are still doing? Uh, Beyonce. Um, there you go. I mean, I mean yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah, that so, someone like her, or I mean, even, um, I mean, even Michael Jackson, like at this point in his career, if you do the math on it, was still immensely huge. It wasn't until maybe like five, 10 years later where he kind of became a bit more of a laughing stock in some people's eyes. And yeah. even then, his album still sold incredibly. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's, you know, if it's not unprecedented, it's still very, it's, there's very few people who have reached these kind of commercial heights and while also offering something that a lot of people find a lot of artistic merit in. Um, so, so yeah, I just, I'm very impressed. I don't know where she ranks for me explicitly as far as like favorite artists go right now. I don't think she's top five, but she's really close. And I will say, I don't know how many other artists would have eight albums, four and a half stars or higher. I think the Beatles are the obvious one for me, and then maybe like one or two others. So did, from that, from that, from that alone, she's in very rarefied air. Did Elton get there or no? Uh, no, I think Elton only had seven. Okay, that's why I was thinking because I didn't think that you were bold enough to give the one or one five. No, I was not. Thank goodness. Proud of you. Thank you. But anyways, um, as I was going to say, I really enjoy Taylor. I think that she is an incredibly influential artist. I think that there is a showcase of more talented modern pop writers because of her. In the early 2020s and late 2010s, we're having people like Billie Eilish. We're having, you know, I'm not the biggest fan of somebody like Olivia Rodrigo, who's very clearly taking from 
Taylor Swift mode and just being able to manipulate it with certain other pop popular styles and just really being able to create something bigger. Like it or hate it, whenever Taylor was really starting to come into her own as a pop artist was probably one of the biggest droughts for like modern pop stars. Like you had 2010 when you have like Black Eyed Peas and have Jason Derulo in some ways at their heights and it's just not a great scene. And whether you like those singles from Speak Now or not, obviously we do to a certain degree, you can't deny just from a pure artistic standpoint, she's far and away hit the pack in that book, in that realm. And for the most part, she's been able to maintain that level of artistry all throughout her career. And it's incredibly impressive what she's been able to do. Like her hater, I do think that there's plenty of merit to be found within the catalog. And even though I don't love it all, there's still good songs across basically every record. So I, I generally agree with your assessment that she shouldn't be cast aside in the way that she often is by many people, although I'm nowhere near to the level of considering her one of the all-time great songwriters or something akin to that, like I know that you are. I know that you've been on record saying before that she is your artist of the decade for the 2010s. Would you hold true with that? Uh, the, I think so, yeah. I feel pretty good about that one. It's hard right. because I think I'll be interested to see what she does in this decade. Um, I, cause I, I, I could see her being someone depending on the direction her next few albums go, where I could see the 2020s maybe becoming a more artistically interesting slash maybe even like a more commercially beneficial decade for her. Like if she can build off of what she is doing now and stay at this level for the next like even five years or so, the 2020s are going to be her decade and that's what's going to be yeah. remembered as like her peak. So I mean, um, hey, you you already have three fives for her in this decade, which yeah blows, blows my damn mind for one thing. But I mean, hey, yeah. I'm happy for you. I mean, you it, yeah, if you discount the Taylor's version albums, then she is three for three on five-star albums in the 2020s for me. The Taylor's version albums are still probably four and a half, so. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Well, that was Taylor Swift. Uh, definitely a interesting artist to do this type of deep dive for because you know a lot of people just stick to those boring ass classic rock and pop artists which they're cool most of my fandom is built across that Love me. but i yeah just this was really nice to do especially after i was listening to all that like we read rem a bunch of different stuff it's just nice to listen to pop every once in a while and I'm really happy that I did this as it really did garner me a fair amount of respect for her that I didn't have before him. And hey, I have two genuinely great records out of it. So couldn't really have asked for me. So yeah. All right. But 